these are two recurring modules, the intro to IDEA and end of quarter projects. And we're gonna take a little bit of time this morning to walk through and uh, just give you sort of an orientation as to how these two modules work, how they are a little bit similar to, but also in many ways different from the other modules. Um, and they do appear in each and every term. They act as kind of bookends for a particular term. <clears throat> And the intro module will give students a bit of an orientation as to how to participate in the course. Uh, then the end of quarter module serves as a kind of capstone assessment, or at least a part of the capstone assessment that you might deliver um, just depending on your model. Unlike the focus and breakout sessions that we did yesterday and that we'll do for the remainder of today, this session will be more of a straight kind of tour and demo, not so much of a workshop and practice. So you really don't need to have your computer available to you now for clicking and things. This is really more just I'll show you. I'm not saying you can't use your computer now, just that you, I'll just show you. <laughs> okay, all right. So we'll begin with the most natural starting point. Intro to IDEA is a recurring module that appears at the beginning of each quarter or term. It will serve as a sort of on-ramp to help bring students up to speed as they get into the course. And this can happen either for a whole class of students, a full, full class beginning together at the beginning of a term, or for individual students who may be starting um, in different quarters if you have, say, many returning students, but just a few ones who will start later in the year, or certainly um, late starters, or if you have rolling enrollment and you have newcomers many times throughout a term, then this can be really helpful for that. If you start a term with a mix of new and returning students, uh, returners are often actually pretty well served by repeating or at least reviewing this module. They can, um, well, as you can imagine, the first time that students go through the Intro to IDEA module, it's a lot of things coming at them. And I know yesterday I heard the metaphor of the fire hose. I think that might have been Jody. <laughs> uh, just the fire hose spraying you with all kinds of new information. And for students, it can be quite overwhelming at the beginning. So they get what's going on with the Intro to IDEA. But as you can imagine, if they do that again after let's say 10 weeks of having participated in the course, now they're starting a new quarter and they get the same information again, they're just gonna have a fully different experience. So they can be well served by repeating or reviewing in that way, but certainly they can also provide some mutually beneficial support to their classmates, to their new classmates. So it's just win-win. Intro to IDEA is presented as a kind of learn while doing uh, model. The teacher and students will work together through can Canvas activities in the face-to-face -face setting, and then students will practice again independently outside of class, be that at home, in a lab setting, in the library, wherever they may do that. But the idea is that they get to work through it together with you, with supervision, maybe even with the support of volunteer or a tech coach, or just supportive classmates. Um, and then they get to experience that again on their own to reinforce, to make sure that they can remember and figure out the steps that they need to walk through and to build that kind of muscle memory or just memory memory. Um, we certainly will encourage instructors to walk through each and every step of the Intro to IDEA module, as you would with any other module, before delivering it in class. Because even though you'll do this together, you may find surprises, and you don't want to be surprised in front of students. You'd rather be surprised on your own. So, <laughs> so just walk through it. Um, another thing that's really important to note about this module is that it doesn't fit in quite with that flipped or blended model that we were talking about yesterday. The canvas work in this module isn't pre-work. It shouldn't be pre-work. It really is, it is the work, and so it's what we do all together. So it's just a bit, it's a bit different, and so it needs a little bit of different messaging. I'm gonna flip over um, to Canvas now on the screen and give you a little bit of a tour so you can see some examples of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. 
So inside the Canvas course that we're working on right now, down below the focus session four materials and the student modules, you'll see a module called Intro to Idea and End of Quarter Projects. Um, if you, if whenever you do, if you will open that one, you'll find the presentation that we're using now and a few handouts that I'll show on the screen um, in a few minutes here. And then below that, you'll be able to see a tech skills pre-assessment, the intro to idea module itself, that's the student module, the end of quarter projects module, that's also a student module, and then I believe the tech skills post-assessment. So that little sandwich is waiting for you um, down below down below this workshop module. So I'm gonna scroll down just far enough to see the intro to idea module. It's marked doing class in the title, just so we don't forget. And I'm gonna pop that one open so we can take a look at a few things. You'll notice as you explore this module that the activity types are similar to or really the same as the labeling that you see is going to be the same as what you see in other modules. You see we learn labels like discuss, practice, read and listen, read and do. So that's setting up for students um, sort of a way of learning how to do how to do idea while doing idea. Yeah, you see what I mean, I think. So, um, so that the types of activities are the same, but the content in these activities and the content of this module is idea itself, as opposed to being some other kind of content theme. So, um, you also know, you'll recall from yesterday that each module typically has five subtopics and that would correspond to sort of one per day in a five day delivery model. This one is a little bit different. Um, we can see the objectives listed at the top and then a first subtopic, what is project idea? A second subtopic, what is Canvas? And a third subtopic, using email. There's one more called practice makes perfect and actually that is just a single item that reminds students, psst, go back, do all the activities again or at least some of them to practice. So. Practice makes perfect. And like in every other module, there is an extra practice page at the bottom that will have links to um, the vocabulary from the module and also several external links that students can peruse and pursue if they want to look for things like keyboarding practice or more, um, more computer vocabulary, um, tech sort of technology vocabulary, even in um, perhaps their own language. So scrolling back to the top, in the project, sorry, what is project idea subtopic? You'll also notice that there are more than the usual five items, five line items for students. Again, this module is a little bit different in that way, but these will be things that students will do together with you in the classroom. The activity types here, read and watch. There's a learn, a discussion, some read and listen activities, and then a read, listen, and watch. Advice for new students. This is a really fun, um, a really just a fun page with I think four short videos that were recorded just on the built-in webcam on the Idea laptops by some students um, who had worked through IDEA already. Some students, I believe from Pierce College, I could be wrong about that. Um, I wish Julie, Julie Sandino were here again this morning, she could confirm. Uh, but anyway, it's just four students talking right into their computer and giving new students sort of their assessment of the program, some recap of what they experienced and, you know, that sort of energetic, you can do it, kind of bolstering and sort of a pep talk. Uh, from students who've been through the program. So that's kind of a fun one for um, students to watch and for you to experience together. In the next subtopic, what is Canvas? We can open up and take a look at a couple of activities. Um, let's look at read, listen, and watch, which is, uh, the topic is practice quizzes. So as I scroll down this page, we can see the read and listen content. And 
image embedded there. Listening to support uh, this, that same reading. And then the watch portion here is, in this case, not a video. We've seen a lot of the watch, you know, we've talked about that a lot of those are, um, they're housed in YouTube, but they're typically um, narrated PowerPoints or things that have been, you know, produced in in house. But with this one, it's just a little bit different. Read and watch, how to take a practice quiz. This one is an animated Google Doc. Um, but if I, if I stop scrolling for long enough, you can see that there's a kind of GIF or GIF. You can choose your pronunciation there. Um, but just sort of showing what it will look like when a student is ready to answer different types of questions and what it would look like to fill in a short answer question what it would look like to do to pull a drop down menu and even a little tutorial on how to do that recording in the pronunciation practice portion of the learn and how to submit so you see what i mean the activity type is the same but the content is idea itself If I move to the next activity, this is a practice on practice quizzes. So <laughs> I'm going to go to the, the preview here. So true, false questions. Question one, practice quizzes will help you learn English. We're answering a true, false question, but it's a question about practice quizzes. You can take a practice quiz only one time, true or false. Practicing multiple choice questions, fill in the blank questions, and so forth. All right. So why does this work? <laughs> well, why, do, why, why indeed? These two-in-one activities um, act to teach the content to the students while also giving them that simultaneous practice. And they get to have the support of, again, doing this together with their instructor, with their classmates, with the support of perhaps a tech coach or another volunteer who might be able to assist you in the classroom during this time. Students get the opportunity to work through activities multiple times by doing them in class and then again outside of class to reinforce again. And then, really importantly, I think, they get that opportunity to sort of ramp up to the full workload. We've talked about full idea as being very intensive time-wise, that the students will have their nine or 10 hours of um, face to, sorry, pre-work, typically pre-work, followed by nine to 10 hours of the face-to-face -face within a week. In this particular week, the face-to-face -face comes first, and the online portion is sort of their follow-up practice. But but indeed, that time can be very intensive. In this week, they don't have two hours of things to do before they come to class and then do two hours of things and then go prep for the next day and then come again. It's not quite so rigorous and demanding in terms of time in that week, so they can sort of ramp up. There are, not surprisingly, some challenges that we might associate with this module, so let's get in to a few of those. One is certainly the intensity. And this can be, as you can imagine, an overwhelming process for some students. So it's great to be able to move through this step by step together. It's quite possible that you have students come to you, either come to you or just look bewildered or terrified in such a way that would give you the impression that they are confused or overwhelmed, whether they can articulate it that way or not. Um, but you, you can assure them, I think, hopefully, even from your own experience, that within a couple of weeks, they're going to feel much better. For you, I don't think it's taking a couple of weeks. I think we saw, um, for those of you for whom this is new material, yesterday, a lot of growth and feelings of power in the first day. Um, but knowing that for students, that may take a little longer, but you know they can get there. And you can reassure them of that. 
The first week also sets up a kind of a funny dynamic with some mixed messages. We make a point of letting students know, yes, this is your English class. Yes, this is your English language class. This is your ESL class. It's not a computer class. We're using computers to learn, but this is your English class. Meanwhile, please open up your laptop or please sit in front of that lab computer and we're going to only look at computers for the next two hours together, day after day. So mixed messages, right? And that can be challenging and, um, and a bit confusing. Um, and, and also, I think, probably serve to send kind of the wrong message. It sets things up just you know, in a weird way to begin with. So it can be very helpful to just regularly restate and reassure and remind students that the first week is different, that the first week is different because this week I'm teaching you how to do this class. I'm teaching you how to use Canvas. Next week, you'll be able to use Canvas on your own. And when you come to class, we'll be doing our face-to-face -face activities together. Your face, my face, face-to-face. Um, then when we come to the end of that first week, the end of that intro module, making a very direct and marked point of the shift into the regular model for delivering the class can also be helpful. Okay, we're done with this part now. Now it starts for real and just letting them know. Certainly some tech challenges, some troubleshooting may come your way in that first week. And we, we, it's not May. I mean, we know it will. It's just what it will look like in each of our different settings. In my setting, when we first started IDEA, it was that for the first five or six weeks of that first 10-week quarter, we didn't have any laptops. It was challenging to teach a hybrid class with no laptops, but we did it. <laughs> it took some computer lab time. We camped out in that computer lab, just always watching at the end of an hour. Is there another class coming? No? OK, stay logged in. Let's go. <laughs> Let's roll. So um, anyway, the, whatever the tech challenges will be will be different depending on your setting, different depending on the equipment that you're using, the devices that you have, the support structure that you have. So just being proactive about testing things, working with your IT department or your internal IT troubleshooting mode, turning it on, um, and just working through those things to make sure that things are, are ready and set up will serve you very, very well. In terms of preparation and getting ready to make, to make this be the most successful experience that it can be in this first week, of course, we've talked about the importance of previewing each page, pre previewing each activity. This serves a couple of purposes. One is that certainly it will let you know what students will see. It will help you to anticipate any challenges that might come for them or questions that they may have. But also, um, the, the dual purpose is that by working through activities ahead of time, whether by switching into that student view um, that you can do through your settings in Canvas, or just by clicking on the preview mode in, in a quiz like I did just a minute ago, you switch from seeing your, your teacher screen to actually being able to walk through what the activity looks like and take the quiz itself or um, type a discussion post and have it show up uh, generated as a test student response. That'll be your new first and last name, test student. Oh, filed alphabetically, student, comma, test. So um, what that will do then is give you it will generate those responses so that when you want to walk through with students what it looks like to find new grades and review teacher feedback and locate that, you won't need to show another student's work, um, but you wouldn't be able to show it from your own account because you don't have any of that feedback because you don't have a teacher. You are the teacher. So by generating those test student responses, it just gives you something to work from um, as a model that can be really useful. Certainly, it's also helpful um, if you can line up any kind of extra support, an extra set of hands for this, this intro week in particular. If you have access in your model to working with someone who's assigned to your class as a technology coach, be it for the first week or two or throughout your quarter or throughout your term, that's great. 
If you don't have access to that kind of resource, that sort of human resource, it's okay. Um, but if you have someone you can maybe pull from e-learning or IT to just help you temporarily, that's great. If you have a work-study student who might be able to be temporarily assigned to your class, that's great. But even if you have a sister or a son-in-law or a best friend who can come, um, someone who, particularly in, in this Intro to Idea module, there's not a lot of um, very high-level, difficult, software-specific, application-specific kind of instruction that needs to be given. It's really just someone who is not tech-fearful and someone who is comfortable with mousing skills and can help students know, no, you need to click here. Or, no, when it says username, you want this one. And when it says password, you need this one. Or, oh no, you can't type a space in the middle of your password, there's the problem. Or your username doesn't have any capital letters, whatever it might be, right? Just someone who has enough familiarity, what for most of us is really just that second nature knowledge, but it isn't second nature for all of our students. So if you're gonna have support in that way, that's great. Also, just thinking realistically, practically, about the fact that if you're demonstrating these activities for students and you're at the front of the room, then it's great to have at least one pair of eyes who can be standing behind students where you can see, where the person can see what's going on on their screens. You can't see that. You can see their bewildered faces, <laughs> but you can't see what's going on on their screen. And so someone standing behind can just at a glance see, oh, you're on a different page. Yeah? Okay, so extra hands. How can we maximize, um, maximize this module and get the most out of it? Really, um, you can think of this module as just one giant teachable moment. That's really how it's set up. But a few particular tips might be things like making a point of talking through your steps as you navigate and click around in Canvas and move to different activities. Just to talk through those steps and reveal your own thinking processes. It is similar to what I might think of as um, some of the things that we do in reading apprenticeship model that metacognition, just seizing the power of that and talking through, um, narrating your own process. Taking time to build in and layer in some community building activities of your choice um, is also a really important part of this week, of the intro module. It's important both for maintaining balance in what is otherwise a very tech heavy week for, and also for keeping the format of the class in perspective. If we make a point of, just make a very deliberate point, a very deliberate act of doing those, what we would already normally want to do in our first week, these community building activities, that's where we do a lot of speaking and listening, a lot of interpersonal communication. And so um, we're just it serves to kind of balance out and keep the real class format in view. Even though we have our computers, we are working face to face and this is what we do. The nature of that in that week is different, but the fact of it um, doesn't have to be altogether different. Certainly it's also very important, as we all know, just for establishing from the beginning that really positive group interaction and group function. You can also uh, consider after students do what, what we'll get a chance to, I think probably show you uh, in more detail a little bit later today, but this tech skills pre-assessment, that's something that students will do at the very, very beginning. And once you can see the results from that, um, just even at a glance, it will give you a good, quick idea of which students have some computer comfort and which students perhaps don't. And so you may consider some selective seating or pairing or small grouping based on those results. Um, not that you're expecting or relying upon your more experienced students to support the less experienced students and not that you would necessarily um, ask that of them in those first few days, but it's just, a lot of that is just human nature. If I've already clicked where I need to be and I can see that the person next to me isn't quite sure what needs to happen, there's just a natural um, connection that can form there. So you can help it along, matchmaking. 
All right, a few more little tips and tricks um, that we can offer here. I'm going to take a minute here to walk through four different handouts that may be of use to you. Um, most of these are not IDEA official documents, um, and so they're not things that you'll find in the Google Drive, but they are attached here you can see the hyperlinks. They're attached to this slideshow, and they're all, they also will appear in the Canvas module, in our, in our workshop module. Um, they're there, so that if they, it looks like something that might be useful to you, you can always feel free to just pull it down from there. These are mainly things that we produced um, on my campus just to help along what was going on for us. And so again, if they're useful to you, or if you can use them or adapt them, please feel free. Just quickly so that you'll um, have a good clear idea of where to find those. I'm going to close my intro to idea module because I'm not going to be working in that anymore at the moment. But the module right above it, sorry, two above it, the workshop module that contains the slideshows, etc. Under examples shared, you'll see these four documents. The first one is a password manager page. This one actually, I believe there is a form of, the pa of a password manager in, um, that will be attached through your face-to-face -face components folder in the Intro to Idea module or also linked as a hyperlink in the handouts in that instructional guide for the Intro module. Um, so this one is just slightly adapted for our setting. So just a, a place for students to put their name, their Canvas username and password, um, what for our campus was the you know, local network login information. And then for my students, I will often set them up with a typing.com account if they're interested in just some keyboard practice. In this class, I don't require them to do that, but many students would like to move from one finger to two finger to 10 finger typing. And so, um, so if they're interested, I'll set them up with that. And then, um, so they've got a place to store that information. Now this one, when we talk about mixed messages, <laughs> I hear the chuckles, you know what I'm thinking. Is it a good idea for us to write down passwords? No, we know that. And we're gonna, we're actually this afternoon gonna talk about, um, we're, one of our afternoon modules is internet basics. And one of the chief things we talk about in that module is, security of your information and not writing down your passwords and leaving those in places where people can find them. But in reality, if you have a class of 30 students and they can't find their password, we're not gonna get anywhere. So if we need to, so this is a practical, pragmatic approach. If you're not comfortable with it, that's okay. But um, another thing to think about is just having that conversation about the, what the sort of conflict there. Usually we don't want to write down a password, but there's a difference between writing down your password for Canvas that you're going to use for your class on campus and writing down your birth date, social security number, and bank account number together on a tidy piece of paper and putting it in your pocket and losing it at the grocery store. It's different. And so if we need to talk about the ambiguity there, it's OK. But anyway, password manager, I use it. And I won't tell you to use it, but you might want to use it. OK, next one. Oh, that's a great question. I have students keep this. Um, again, things I should not be saying, but depending on the student, I will also keep all of their passwords in my own somewhere protected, not where it's going to get lost and accessed, but there's certain students where you kind of know they're going to lose that paper. So, OK. And I usually copy this on some bright piece of paper so I can say, no, where's the orange one? Where's the orange one? So you need your orange paper today. Less. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so to recap, I think what Les is saying, I'm looking at you, Les, I think what you're saying is you, the students do have unique passwords, but you assign the password. Okay. And so then you, you have a record of it. And I guess another way that I think about that often is um, just the way that, that many, um, you know, on our campus, at least with Canvas, they have a default password. It's not the same for every student, but you know it's going to start out as this based on your own information. It's you know something about your birth date or the letters in your last name or whatever. And I always think that once students have that, yeah, everybody's going to know what it is because everyone, I mean, I know your last name, so I know your password. But students who have the ability to change it and have enough concern to, to know that it might be a good idea to change it, we'll just change it for themselves. And students who aren't there yet will keep the one that they had, and that probably will serve them well because then you're in the best position to support them. So, okay, so again, there's a little ambiguity there, and you can do what is comfortable for you and what feels safe and is approved in your setting, but some ways to think about passwords. Great. The next document that I'll show is one that we made called, Where Can I Get Online? <laughs> I'm going to blow this one up just so it'll be a bit bigger. Where can I get online? I can get online at school. This is just something to walk through with students, but again, something that they can keep as a, as a reference. Being able to get online at school using their college laptop or using a college computer, a wired computer, in a library or computer lab, et cetera. And then, you know, making sure that students know you can log in using your campus Wi-Fi where applicable, or if you're on a wired computer, you'll log in through whatever credentials that you have. Reminding students, maybe they have the opportunity to log in at home. Again, if they have a college assigned laptop, great. If they have a home computer, great. If they need help setting up internet service or figuring out how to get a hotspot or how to use a hotspot that you may have issued to them or borrowing one from the library, whatever it might be, right? You can see how this is going to be very different depending on what your setting and your model are. But just the idea of having, making a document like this and walking through it with students um, just to raise their awareness and make sure that they know that they have multiple ways to do this stuff, not only in your classroom, um, in your presence. And then reminding them, and they know, but reminding them and talking through places in the community where they can access the internet or use have computer access. So at the library, whether they're, they're using their computer, the library computer, or um, where they can get access to Wi-Fi in the community, and that question, where else can you get online? You know students are very quick to answer. Starbucks and McDonald's and wherever it might be. So they know what's up. The third document I'd like to share is um, just a page that we made. It, we Honestly, we didn't make this right away. This was something that after quite a few quarters, probably longer than it should have taken for me to figure it out, I, I came to realize, you know, it would be helpful for students to have a list. It's almost like an FAQ style thing where they've got different types of help and support that they may need. And we as instructors are accustomed to being the everything, right? We're, we're accustomed to helping our students with a wide variety of needs that may be nothing to do with our actual job description and may be well above our pay grade, but we're just used, we're used to being financial counselors and we're used to, you know, lots of things. Um, employment counselors, yes, I'll help you understand the voicemail from your doctors. We're used to doing a lot of tasks, but when we're in, um, let's say, a community college setting or a variety of other types of settings in our communities, 
there are other resources available to our students. And realistically, when it comes down to it, neither we nor our students are best served by us trying to meet all of those needs. We can and we're willing and really oftentimes very joyful to be able to do that. But um, we can make use of our own personal resources and conserve our what? Conserve our well, conserve our bandwidth a little bit better by helping students find those other resources. And most importantly, we can empower them more. We can help them find those resources for themselves. And so isn't it a good idea to do so? So when I say it took me longer than it should have to sort of figure this out, OK, so I've confessed all of that. All right. So. Um, this was a listing. I'm actually going to, well, I am going to leave it blown up and scroll down just so you can get an idea of what's there. But if you need help with your net ID, your password, that's kind of for their college login, go to the help desk. That's basically letting them know, we have an IT department. Here's how you can connect with them. And here's why you might want to connect with them. Here's when and how to connect with them. If you have general questions about a computer, you can go to that same help desk with IT, but you could also go to the library, and there are computer tutors. By the way, you can use a computer there. If you need help with stuff that's Canvas specific, we have an e-learning office. You can go to e-learning and get some help from them in their space. If you have questions about language, not your computer stuff and your Canvas stuff, but questions about language, it might be something you're doing in Canvas, but it's English what you're trying to work on, you can go to the Student Learning Center, go to our Writing Center, what we call page one. And you can get access to a tutor there, and we can talk about the other ways that tutors can support them there beyond just their classwork for this particular course. And then, of course, at the bottom, any questions, anytime, come to your teacher, right? It's still there. <laughs> we're still there, and we're not trying to push you away. But we just want you to know that when you don't have access to us, there's a world of resources available to you. And I think it's really important both for our students to know that and for our campuses, for example, if you're in a campus setting, but whatever your setting might be, for, for those resources to know about our students and to be prepared to serve them. They're, they're among the students who are there to be served. And so let's make sure that, that our campus resources are ready to serve all of the students and not just the native speaking students. Okay, I don't need to go on about that anymore. The last document I'll show here is a pre-work plan. And we talked yesterday at the beginning of that focus session one about helping students to understand the importance of pre-work and helping them to figure out how to do that and kind of fit it in. This is sort of a, it's, it's a conceptual piece, but it really is a kind of a time management strategies kind of piece. And there is a time management module that you'll find in IDEA. But um, all aside from that, taking some time to be really proactive and deliberate at the beginning of your course to talk and, and help students plan about how they'll complete their pre-work can really pay off some big dividends. So to succeed in class, I plan to do my pre-work online the day or night before my face-to-face -face class. Think about where and when you will do your pre-work and check the boxes that match your plan. Where? I will do my pre-work and there are all kinds of places that a student might do their pre-work. Maybe, maybe it's at school in several different places. Maybe it's going to be in the community at the library. Maybe at home. Maybe in a local business where they can have access to Wi-Fi if they have a, a device that they're working on. And when I have time to do my pre-work, and let's think very specifically and clearly, what is it for each student? It's one thing to say, yes, I'll do my work before I come to class, or to say, you need to do your work before you come to class. But if we don't know when or can't think about when to actually fit that in, um, it may not happen. And so just taking some time to strategize, good idea. So are you going to do it before you come to class in the morning, or earlier in the morning, or late at night after your kids are in bed? Is it going to be um, after you've taken your shower at night and I'll have you recording me little videos with your hair wrapped up in a towel because you just washed it, whatever it might be. Maybe I see your kids running around in the background of your video. 
I don't know. But it's really interesting um, to see and to know from students how they will go about this in such different ways. And it's one of the things that's such a powerful part of this model, um, this hybrid model where students are able to learn so much on their own and then be able to come to class. But the part that's on their own is so individual. And it's really interesting and gives us um, a, really an interesting look into their lives just even by helping them plan this. So. All right, those are the four documents that I wanted to show you. And I'm going to get back into our slideshow now so that Shannon can come and talk with us about the end of quarter presentations. So good morning. I always like to voice my appreciation and thanks to Adria for sharing those incredible documents that she did at the end. Because I, I think the other teachers in the room who have experience with that will recognize the importance of the information that those documents capture. So thank you again, Adria, for providing those and adding links to them. Um, but we're gonna move on now to the end of quarter projects. And in this session, more time is definitely given to the intro and that really is reflective of the level of interaction and support and kind of high touch needed from the instructor in that intro week. Students come in a little bit like perhaps you felt yesterday, a little bit wide eyed and there is just a flood of new information and it's heavy on the technology that first week and you're trying to balance it with the English. So there, there's just a lot more need for support and that messaging to begin right away. And when that happens in that first week successfully, the students are able to access the information online and be successful working through the modules to then arrive at the end of quarter projects in that last week. And hopefully, like you will be feeling when we enter into our last session today, you're going to feel so competent and ready with the material to just go and get your hands on it. That's how students feel in this uh, end of quarter project. So it serves really as a capstone project uh, that celebrates all the hard work and all the growth that the students have experienced over the quarter. And it allows them an opportunity to showcase the new language skills that they've developed potentially the technology, uh, no, the technology skills they've developed and potentially the presentation skills that they have also gained during the quarter. And one thing to keep in mind is this could perhaps be competing with other required assessments that you have and other end of quarter responsibilities that come into play, but this is a, uh, it's a wonderful way for them to uh, celebrate everything they've done and it can be a great enhancement to the other perhaps more paper-based traditional test assessments, things like CASAS and other things that you might be giving them. So let's look at what this means. The basics, there are problem project-based uh, thematic situations that they are presented with that are aligned to the eight themes that you have taught that quarter. So that's how it's written. However, if you're doing a tailored model and you choose just four of those units, for example, then you'd be looking at the problems that correlated to those four. The types of presentations that they can give, or the formats are a slideshow, an oral presentation, a paragraph, a short essay, or a skit. So there's a lot of different ways that are built in here for them to be able to uh, showcase this. These student projects can be done individually or as pairs or in small groups. So there's a lot of uh, personalization here depending on your group and their preferences and needs and desires as you reach this part of the quarter. And why it works. Because there are so many different ways for them to, to showcase this, you have the eight potential problems, you have the five different formats for them to show it in, that I think it really speaks to what we talked about in that first session, which was uh, UDL, that Universal Design for Learning. You can really ask that, there's multiple means of representation here. So thinking about your group, thinking who's in there, you really can personalize this to what is best going to suit uh, their needs and what they want. 
The structure of this module allows students to return to a particular module of interest and connect more deeply with that particular topic, but at the same time be synthesizing everything they've learned in all of the modules. So it allows them to bring across that language, the thematic content, and the technology skills. And I would say that, again, I, uh, at our school we use CASAS, and so that's one measurement. I also have a locally required traditional pen and paper test. But I feel like the students connect most deeply with this because they're really able to kind of engage with it in the way that most accurately sort of reflects their learning style. One thing to keep in mind about this unit, so we talked about the intro, and there's a lot of need for um, instructor support to the students during that. This week is very much student-led. The teacher is really there as a guide and a support, and you are kind of walking them through just a few, a few assignments that are shared by all of these different uh, possibilities, but it is student-led, student-generated. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'd like to show you uh, quickly what the situations look like, what these problems look like. Because something to keep in mind during this is there is a lot of need for instructor preparation and previewing before it happens. So I'm gonna pop out here just for a second. And I just pulled up one to show you an example of what this might look like. So this one is for navigating your community. So the students are directed into pairs, individually, or groups at your discretion, and then are presented with these options. There are eight. You have to think about, am I going to give them a choice of all eight? Am I going to choose one and ask everybody to do that? Or will I give them a couple of choices and allow them to self-select what they might like to do? So there is preparation that needs to happen on the teacher's part before entering into this. And I'll just kind of scroll down here so you can see another one. Money management. And I will say, uh, the students really like uh, these situations. They got very excited when they saw one that, that yeah, 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 I want to do that one. And so I, I personally did not give all eight as options. I felt like that was quite overwhelming for them. So on a couple of occasions, I had them do it. Here's the problem. You guys can all do this. But then I felt like, no, let's, let's see what they might like to do. So I picked kind of a couple highlights from the quarter of, of particular themes that seemed to connect really well with the group. And I said, you guys can choose from these. That went down particularly well in my experience. I know we also have some other experienced instructors in the room, and I would encourage you to talk to them about how they previewed these and, and how they presented the options to the students, because there's so much flexibility that it can seem overwhelming. So hearing about what went successfully for some of the other instructors, I hope you'll get a chance to speak with some of them. Oh, OK. Uh, I also want to show you, if I can, this is what the Google Drive looks like for that quarter. So you can see here that we have all of the same components. It should look familiar, but if I go to the face-to-face, there's not as many things that you as the instructor need to be walking through with the students. So in the, this all project types, that's the document that I just opened for you, so you can see all eight projects. But then as, as you move on, each of these individual folders are for the specific type of project that you have asked them to do, because you can choose to have them all do a presentation with Google Slides. You could ask them all to do skits. You might be allowing them to choose how they want to present their solution to these situations and problems. So if we go back out here, I do want to show you what the end of quarter, oop, sorry, instructional guide looks like. Because we've been talking about how really the instructional guides lay out for you very clearly throughout each class the activities that you'll be doing and the average time that those items will take. And this one starts to look a little different. <laughs> Two hands here. 
So the first, the first part of it looks similar, but when we get down to the actual activities, you know, reviewing the quarter, introduction to problem-based learning, this looks familiar, we've got times on it. And then the next one we've got introducing presentations an hour. But introducing Google Slides an hour. You're obviously not going to be doing all of these, so this is another importance of previewing this. What have you asked your students to do? So you're gonna to need to go into the lesson plan and find just those items that are relevant to what you're asking them to do. There are some documents that the students will be going through uh, that are the same for all project types. So whether some students might be doing skits and others might be doing a brochure or an essay, they have some planning documents that they'll all be walking through and those are the same for every project type, but you're going to have to be choosing what those look like and then finding the instructions for that part in this instructional guide. There's a lot of time built into class for students to be doing collaborative work um, and designing their projects. So anyway, a, a big piece of this is just the importance of instructor previewing from the beginning, because there's a lot of choices you get to make, and that's going to change what's happening in the classroom and what you need to be looking at. Okay, so previewing all the problems, and then for the topics, allowing this, you know, deciding how you're going to do this, allowing students to choose from all the options, whether you're going to give them a limited list, assign the same to all, or perhaps assigning different options to different groups, and then exploring those resources in the Google Drive. How to maximize it? Again, we come back to this planning, planning, planning. It's not as much touch time, but there is a lot of pre-planning. That's where I think most of the instructor energy and effort is going to go this week. And they're gonna to wanna to consider the beginning, uh, beginning this module before the final week. If you are going to ask them to choose which situation they wanna do, it would be good to give them their options perhaps the week before um, so that they could come in and then be prepared to just jump into that in that week. A lot, plenty of time, again, might be competing with other items, so you need to be structuring, you know, in that week, where do you have the time for them to be doing their group work and planning and designing that uh, within the class time. And then breaking the tasks down into steps. So again, they have documents that they'll be working through that are planning, designed to help with the planning, but you wanna kind of give those out one at a time, let them get through a set of that before moving on to the next step because you will have groups who just wanna, boom, we're done. Uh, we're just gonna throw this together. But there really are steps. You want them to be going back, really thinking about these topics, using the language, so help, helping them to kind of walk through that process. Uh, there are challenges. It's a lot of fun. So the first thing I wanna say is this week is a lot of fun uh, and the students really enjoy it, but there are some challenges because it can be very overwhelming. So the more prep that you can do to help break down those tasks for them and maybe limit the number of options, the more successful it's going to feel to the students. They'll just kind of feel like, okay, we're just walking through these steps. Please keep in mind varying degrees of participation. If you're going to be putting people in pairs or within groups, uh, thinking about how that looks. I know that group projects, it's often voiced that group projects can be very challenging in any learning environment. And these students may or may not have time outside of class to be coming together. So taking into account, for example, attendance is another, uh, another factor within this. If you have a student you know just because of other life responsibilities and circumstances is not able to attend every day, if you're putting in partner, just in pairs with a partner, being thoughtful about who, who they may be with, or maybe you need to have one group of three, so that might be a good group to put them in, just taking those things into consideration. And this is a quick turnaround time. Again, this is, you know, if you do full idea as it was designed, this is a one-week project that, again, can be competing for time with other items. There's also quick turnaround time for instructor feedback because your students, you wanna make sure they're on the right track, you wanna make sure they're doing what they need to do, that everybody in the group is participating and being able to give your feedback, that's quick. So taking that into consideration as well. 
couple tips and tricks to help it feel a little more successful. Yesterday, hopefully everybody understood about the publish and unpublish tool, and it becomes critical in this particular instance. So when you bring in this unit, it's published. The students can see every submission for every type of format, the skit, the essay, the presentation. It's all there for them. They can see all the materials. They want to do it. They want to do it week one when they don't know how to navigate very clearly. <laughs> and so from experience, I came in on week two, said to everybody, hey, you know, how, how was it? They'd gone home and practiced what we had done the work before and they'd done their pre-work. And one student was like, oh, teacher, it took me so long, which does happen, right? This is all new. Some people have bigger learning curves. Well, when I went in to do my correcting, I discovered she had submitted every final project to some varying degree. And I thought, well, no wonder. <laughs> she felt incredibly overwhelmed. And I realized I just hadn't thought that students would go to what is genuinely the bottom of the page, really. You know, I thought they'd kind of hover to the top. So that was my first lesson in the importance of publishing and unpublishing. So my tip to you is unpublish the module before class even starts. And don't publish anything until you're really ready for them to start previewing it or working on something. And even then, only publish the items that you're going to be asking them to do. So if nobody's doing a skit, don't publish it, because chances are somebody will do it just because they wanted extra work or they didn't understand. So anyway, that, it, that, that will really help, I think, reduce how overwhelming it can seem for some students. <laughs> And then this is also a really exciting time for the students to showcase what they've learned and this wonderful project. So potentially inviting in other classes to come and observe, administration, family and friends, perhaps recording it if people are open to that. That's not always a hit with the well, with anybody, right? But um, <laughs> if that's something of interest. But this is a really great way also for you to show the administration what your lower level ESL students are doing. They will be amazed at the level of language production that is happening at the end of this quarter and really being able to show them how we're helping them to move forward faster, to be able to be ready to be successful, to transition on to the workplace, to more academics. and. I just think it's, it's something that is, um, it's a really joyful experience and people come away at the end, I think, feeling very proud of themselves. You see a lot of pride in the students and so that's a wonderful thing to be able to share with a larger community if possible. So thank you so much for your time. Hopefully that gives you a sense of these very common modules that are in <laughs> every quarter. And uh, if you have other questions about that, we'll be happy to answer on either the intro or end of quarter. So thank you so much. Thank you.